loved ones, would you turn in the Bible to Revelation 3 and 20? Revelation 3 and 20. And it's page 1074 in that Revised Standard Version. Revelation 3 and 20. Most of us know these words. They've been repeated often since we were children to us. Revelation 3 and 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. And most of us know that verse from at least Billy Graham evangelistic crusades and probably most of us from hearing it at some evangelistic service in our home church. We all know that it's the verse that's quoted to indicate that God is willing to come into your heart and to take over your life and to give you a sense of his favor and his love in your own personal heart. And you probably, like me, have felt that's what I need. That's what I need. Religion, I believe in it. I believe in Christianity. I believe in the sense of going to church. And I believe in this Bible. But it isn't real to me inside. It isn't warm and real in my own heart. And I don't know how to get it real. And maybe you've often come up at evangelistic crusades or evangelistic services and you've repeated those words even to yourself. Lord, I know that you're saying to me, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And then you have gone through all kinds of contortions to try to open the door of your heart. And I don't know what you have gone through. But I know I myself went through all kinds of what I thought were mystical experiences. And I tried to imagine in my own mind, the Lord Jesus is here in this room. He's at this altar rail. He's in this room where I'm seeking him. And he's right here and he's willing to come into my heart. And all I have to do is ask him. And I tried to imagine him coming into my heart. And I was unable Or you tried singing the verses of a hymn because you thought if I can get the atmosphere of that meeting that I was at where I felt God stirring me, if I can recapture that feeling that I had, then I'll know the warmth of God in my heart. And yet it has never come real for you. It has never really taken place. And you may have actually come to this body for years. And yet still it isn't real to you. And I would appeal to two groups of you actually. One of you who might be very intellectual. And might have to work out everything in the mind. And you might be in the position where you're saying. It's just not for me that kind of closeness that other people talk about. I happen to be more cold blooded than other people. I'm just coldly intellectual. I think things through. So I can't expect the reality of Jesus in my life that other people have who aren't quite, quite as intellectual. Indeed, I, if you're like some of us, you might think actually it's rather embarrassing to have anything too emotional or warm inside. And you might have decided, I am an intellectual Christian. That's what I am. No, I don't feel God particularly close to me. I don't feel very great warmth of his presence in my life. I don't feel he is personally showing his favor to me. But I believe all the things that this book says, and I believe that he is not against me. And you might be in that position. Of many of us who are intellectuals where we feel, well, what we have is enough. Admittedly, it doesn't seem to be exactly what other people have who are real with God, but it seems to be enough. I speak also to those of you who are emotional and who think to yourself, well, if I can only get an emotional experience of Jesus in my heart, that's what I need. And so you go from church to church to church to atmosphere to atmosphere trying to get that emotional experience that will convince you that God is in your heart, that the Savior has come in to take over your life and to dwell there. Brothers and sisters, None of that is right. None of that is right. None of those things are right. That's not where 
Jesus coming into your heart is at at all. It has nothing to do with that stuff. It has nothing to do with your emotionalism. Nothing to do with your intellectualism. It has nothing to do with mystical experiences. It's nothing to do with kind of a momentary experience. It isn't, loved ones. It's on a far more down-to-earth level than that. And the reality that loved ones feel of Jesus in their heart does not come from an emotional experience or from an intellectual experience or from a mystical experience. It comes from a spiritual experience. And a spiritual experience is real and down to earth and plain and simple. And it's the one that the dear old Jew, old Wayne Schwartz, he's a dear fella, you'd love him, you know. It was so enjoyable meeting him in Mexico. He's a New Yorker and just a happy old New York Jew. And just so outgoing and so happy and so wears his heart on his sleeve. And he is the dearest guy. And I hope he'll come up, you know, someday and and spend some time with us here. It's where Wayne Schwartz experiences. That's it. That's it. My wife is very different from Wayne Schwartz. And yet she came through the same experience. I'm very different from Wayne Schwartz. I came through the same experience. Anybody who comes to the point where they're asking Jesus in their heart finally finds out that the reason... They can't experience the witness of the Spirit. And it's the witness of the Spirit that counts. It's not emotionalism that counts. It's not intellectualism that counts. It's the witness of the Spirit. The reason they don't experience the witness of the Spirit that Jesus has come in is because Jesus hasn't come in because there's something in their heart that won't let him in. And that something is very plain, loved ones. Now I just ask you to look at it in that, in that uh, newsletter. It's on page 4 and... Old Wayne puts it so plainly and so straight that I couldn't put it any better and I don't think any of us could. It's page four. It's on the right-hand column, about halfway up the right-hand column on page four. You see where he says, so Jews could and should believe in Jesus. That's it. So Jews could and should believe in Jesus. The only thing I needed to see then was another Jewish Christian to really see that everything was true. I was then convicted as far as I could be. One night, it finally happened. I met a girl from the States who was Jewish as I was. And she told me about how, 11 years ago, she gave her life to Jesus. That was all I needed. That night, I asked the Lord to come into my life. I'm not exactly sure what I thought would happen, but I knew that nothing did happen. And that's what's happened with a lot of us. I'm not sure that I thought what I, I, I sh- was sure what I thought would happen, but I knew that nothing did happen. Later, I was sleeping at about five or six a.m. and heard a voice telling me that if I would stop sinning, I would have what I wanted. That's it. If I would stop sinning, I would have what I wanted. It was so loud, so clear that it woke me up. Finally, it became clear as to why nothing happened that first time I invited him in. I was still planning on sinning. Uh, Wayne used to cruise the beaches and pick up the girls. So, uh, he was was trying to continue the old life. And he had asked Jesus in. It happened that the first time I invited him in, I was still planning on sinning. You can't fool God. So, what I was going to do was sin. What I wanted was Jesus. Before I had repented but not with a heart ready to leave sin behind. And God knew it. Very shortly after, I made my decision to leave sin behind, and I prayed once again, and this time, boom, I received the Lord with the Spirit and all His benefits and fruits, joy, peace, patience, love, and everything else that goes with it. Galatians 5.22 For the first time in my life, I had real peace. Praise the Lord. I was now a reborn Christian Jew. This happened on June the 12th, 1982. And now, three years later, I'm still amazed at the storehouse of blessings and promises I've inherited, along with how many people are in need of Jesus to freedom. That's it. That's it. It's not complex at all. It isn't. It's not a complicated thing at all. If you've asked Jesus to come into your heart and nothing has happened, it's only for one reason. It's not because you're not emotional enough. It's not because you're not intellectual enough. 
It's not because you're mystical enough. It's because you still plan on sinning. That's it. God has convicted your heart about something that you should stop doing or something that you should start doing and you are planning on going on doing what he has forbidden or you are planning on going on doing what he has told you not to do. That's it. You know. It just, I know it sounds hideous and I was offended by the whole thing. I felt I, I was a kind of intellectual sophisticate in the university. And I could not believe that God would be so ridiculous as to tie his presence in my life to something as practical and down to earth as stopping being impatient with my mother or stopping being irritable or stopping swearing. But God is. God is disgustingly down to earth. God simply says to you, your sins made my son's death necessary. Your sins killed my son. I cannot give you my son in your heart if you are still involved in putting nails in his hands and a spear in his side. That you have to stop. You cannot plead the blood of Jesus and shed the blood of Jesus at the same time. That's it. In other words, you see what you're doing you're involved in a spiritual impossibility. It's a spiritual impossibility. You can't ask the Savior from sin to come into your life and you continue to practice sin. That's it. So if you want Jesus in your heart and you want God to be real in your life, stop the sins that God has told you are in your life. That's it. That's it, really. I mean, you must have been... Um, you, it, that hits anybody, that. It's so simple and plain, you know. And the dear guy puts it in such an unsophisticated way. He says, I'm not sure what I thought would happen, but I know nothing did happen. He was a Jew. He knew nothing about all the stuff we've been being brought up with for years, but he did what we said he should do, and nothing happened. God is faithful. God is faithful. God won't let anyone be deceived. And then God spoke to him and told him that he had to stop sinning. And when he stopped sinning, he only had to plan to stop sinning. He only had to determine not to sin. And the whole thing became real in a moment. That's it. You know, he didn't. Wayne Schwartz hasn't been at any evangelistic campaigns. He doesn't know anything about all the stuff we go through. He just knows that God is faithful. If you stop sinning, Jesus really does come into your heart. If you don't stop sinning, you can ask him into your heart, but you don't experience anything real. You just experience an emotional thing or a reformation of your life. Well, brothers and sisters, I just make no apology for sharing that again. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to matter how long we are on the journey. It always gets back to that. You know, it doesn't matter how long we are or how saintly we all think we are. It gets back to the matter of stop sinning. And immediately, boom, there comes a presence of God into your life that you could not believe. And it's the same with the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and fills you when you get rid of the things that God has shown you are there. So brothers and sisters, I, I'd encourage you on this, this Father's Day, this first Sunday on campus in 85, if you have tried it before and it's been kind of disappointing, or you've tried it before and it doesn't seem to have worked, would you examine your own life and I'd ask you, is there any sin there that you're planning on continuing? And I'm saying to you, will you stop it now? Will you just plan not evermore to sin that sin? And if you'll be real with your God, he'll be real with you. Now, Sooner or later, 
you'll have to be real with him. Sooner or later, you will meet him. And he will expose those sins to you and to the whole world. But then there will be no forgiveness possible. So, you have to do it sooner or later. It's just now you can do it to salvation. Then you will do it to eternal damnation. So, loved ones, will you do it now? Will you stop it now? Whatever it is. Or whatever it is he's been asking you to start, will you start it now? Will you correct the thing now? Will you change your life to align it with God's will for you? And he will immediately give the witness of his spirit in your heart, in your spirit. And you'll know God is there. You'll know he's there. You will. You'll know he's there. You know, it's not organized at all. I, mean, I didn't know I was going to say these things. I thought I was going to preach the or, or the sermon. And so there's no communion around. So there's nowhere for you to kneel. You should come. You should do whatever needs to be done. Uh, you should come up. You should kneel at this here, you can kneel here, you know, and and you should make a commitment to God. You should. If you have tried before and it hasn't worked, and you see now the very sin that you know you have to forsake, or you see the very thing that you have to do, you should come up, you know, now, and just repent of it to God, and then just go back to your seat. And trust him for the witness of the Spirit, which he will give to you, just when he decides his best for you. But we should do it. So let's just bow in prayer. We can just keep singing that, search me, O God, you know, and, and then we'll sing it maybe four or five times, and then we'll just close. Search me, O God. Oh.